Hey you guys, this is Josh with Homesteading Family and welcome to this episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. As you can see, I'm not with Carolyn today. I am hanging out with Anne of All Trades. Hello and thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm glad to uh, be sitting here with you here in Tennessee. Absolutely. I am uh, here at Anne's place in the shop and if you guys have been following along, you've probably caught that we're doing some filming. Yep. We've got some really neat stuff going on with Anne and other creators that's coming up this fall. So we're not ready to tell you about it yet, but Anne's involved. And it's got something to do with milk goats, and it's going to be really, really cool. And yeah. so it's, it's, we just had a blast filming. Actually, yes. we've been working hard, haven't we? It's been a long couple of days, but literally there's nothing that I love more than teaching and hanging out and getting to know like new friends that are doing similar things over uh, a shared enjoyment of like the stuff that we do. Like I mean, this is the stuff of life, getting to hang out and talk oh, yeah. about it. Oh, yeah. And it's, it is always fun to yeah see what somebody else that's – that's talking about things, that's living it, is doing and share stories and swap what's going on. And so today, after we get through a little chit chat and one of your questions, we're going to be talking milk goats because I actually know nothing about milk goats. Well, you should know something now. Well, okay, now I do. I've got. <laughs> I, I've learned a few things over the last few days. And um, and uh, you guys saw Abigail, my daughter, was here with us, yeah. and it sounds like now we might be getting milk goats after hanging out with you for three days. <laughs> I mean, I tried my best to talk her out of it, but I think that she's she's, she's, she's determined. She's pretty determined, so um, I'm glad we've been getting an education, and we're going to talk about that a little bit and share yeah. some of Anne's expertise, because she knows milk goats inside and out. But uh, first, again, we always do what's called a little chit chat, and yeah. we just kind of check in with what's going on with daily life. So, Great. besides besides this last week of filming, like, what's up with you? What's going on here on the farm in Tennessee this time of year? And like, just what are you up to? Well, it's springtime on the farm here, just like it is pretty much everyone ever else. So we're in baby season. I've just had a bit new baby calf for my milk cow, so we started milking the milk cow, um, putting the garden in, and I'm actually doing a large scale building project here. I'm building a school. Um, where we'll teach disappearing life skills. And so that's pretty much anytime I'm not on the computer or milking goats or milking cows, that's what I'm doing. Very cool. So you're going to have uh, an animal trades, like on-site school physically teaching skills. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's called the School of All Trades. And okay. we will be teaching like woodworking, blacksmithing, um, some garden and homesteady things, but um, we're more focused on the, the craftsmanship side of things. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Well, that's an important set. It's like we talk a lot, and of course, at Homesteading Family, we're really focused yeah. on food. And a lot of what we're talking about is around food production from growing, raising, preserving, cooking. But that's just one part of what we do, right? Yeah. Where we live and, you know, the skills of knowing how to do woodworking, knowing mm -hmm. how to fix things knowing how to work metal a little bit, yep. weld or blacksmith, all of that stuff is super crucial yeah. to the lives that we're trying to live. Oh yeah, it's so funny, man. Like you think, okay, I'm gonna put in a few raised beds, get some chickens, but the the skills that you have to learn start to really compound. And honestly, one of my favorite books, it's called Range, and it talks about the value of having a whole bunch of different skills from different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And the more that we've integrated farm life into our daily life, um, just the more things I've had to learn how to do. Like. Who would have thought I would have ever had to learn how to fix my tractor or, oh, yeah. you know, uh, how to manage a compost pile or anything else. Just like you get some chickens and it's all downhill from there. Man, and you you guys, you can do this. Anne's coming from the place where she grew up into, I believe, the kind of tech corporate world, right? Yeah. Doing marketing yeah. in the high rise. And, yep. and, and, and look at what you're doing now. And you're fixing tractors. Yeah. And, I mean, 10 years ago. Wow. I had never, I, I mean, I always say this in, in my own videos, 10 years ago, I, I picked up my first tool and planted my first seed. Even uh, growing up, we never had a family dog or cat. And so now living on acreage and, and milking cows and, and assisting with goat births, like if you told me I was going to be doing what I'm doing now 10 years ago while I was living in Beijing, I would have laughed in your face. <laughs> like, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yet yeah. here you are, and it's just a testament to, you know, homesteading is not just a thing you go and do and settle land in this legal term anymore. Mm -hmm. It's it's a mindset, right? Yeah. And you can start wherever you're at. That's something we really try to encourage people about is, you know, you don't have to get to five acres or an acre or 40 acres first. You start learning skills right now where you are, and especially today in these times, that's so, so important. Yeah, I mean, yeah. our first farm was on our quarter acre uh, plot in the middle of Seattle. Um, 
you know, I had chickens. It turns out they were illegal at the time, but illegal now, chickens. Yeah, illegal chickens. Uh, you know, and and I dug up our whole backyard, and then I ended up digging our whole front yard, and I was growing almost everything that we ate just in the middle of the city there. Then we ended up getting an acre also in the city, and I was okay. able to expand that a little bit. But yeah, wherever you're at, my favorite thing, my grandpa always said, he's like, use what you've got to get what you need. And so if what you need is to have a little bit more confidence and um, in yourself and your skills and your abilities, if you want to have a little more security and self-reliance, like I've literally seen people with full farms on their balconies in Taiwan. There's people who are raising chickens and like things in like every single pot and pan just has like things growing in it. And it. <laughs> like you can start wherever you're at. Oh, fantastic, cool. Well, glad you're here. Glad you're doing what you're doing. Let's um, jump into a question of the day. Please. And then, we're, then we'll talk milk goats. Okay, so Ern, uh, Ernest Harris, 9082, I think this was from an IG post, says, I'm having an issue composting, not enough material. So I was wondering, could adding fish emulsion to the heap help? Well, there's a couple, a couple of things to right, talk about right off the bat. If you don't have enough material and you're just talking general mass, you obviously got to add a whole bunch of material and fish emulsion is not a lot of, you know, a lot of material in and yeah. of itself. It has a purpose, but you need a, at least a compost pile. that's about three foot by three foot by three foot tall, right? That's, that's the minimum to really successfully compost. Yeah. I don't know about you. I've, I've tried a couple of the turning bands and different things and I don't know. I know they kind of work for some people, but that, that, that's not really seriously composting if you're trying yeah. to grow your own food and get something going. Yeah. I mean, we do like the simplest thing you could possibly do. I have actually two different things here on the farm. I have one just pile that I turn and add things to, but I also have a three bin system that is set up. It's just pallets that I screwed together. It took about an afternoon to put it together. And now we can just, uh, yeah, we can make literally more compost than we could ever use here just in a three bin system like that. But you've got to have three feet by three feet by three feet is a great thing because otherwise it's not going to get hot enough. There's not going to be enough weight on top. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, fish emulsion is, is, is a great thing to add to the garden. But it's well, actually, it's high nitrogen. Yeah. So it's a good, it's a good nitrogen component, right? Yeah. But it's not going to add a lot of mass. If you're just lacking material to get that pile large enough to heat up, yeah. fish emulsion isn't going to do it in and of itself. Yeah, but um, it is very likely that you have on hand or you could easily scrounge oh, up yeah. what you would need to add that extra mass. I mean, shredded paper, cardboard, if you're shopping on Amazon, um, like you've yeah, got all the stuff chips, you need right Wood shavings. There. Yes. Yep. Uh, straw, as long as you can get it clean, that's the big challenge with straw today is getting it clean and not having any chemicals in it. Um, leaves from the trees in the fall, yep. right? Now, if you get them from trees that are cut live, they're going to be more of a green material, a nitrogen material. And, you know, you're talking about fish emulsion, so I'm wondering if your concern is not more nitrogen, more than just mat more material in general. And mm -hmm. fish emulsion is a good nitrogen source, but I would say it's kind of an expensive one. Fish yeah. emulsion is not cheap. Um, you, we could also go down kind of the trail of is it organic or not, where do the fish come yeah. from, you know, some of that. And so I'd say you want to make it organic. But if you're just needing nitrogen, fish emulsion can be cool, but there's a lot of other great things. Uh, coffee grounds, we were talking about. Yeah. Anna and I love our coffee, and she makes a mean espresso. It well, is shoot. espresso, sorry, or somebody corrects me. That's but, okay. Um, but really, really good. Um, so coffee grounds, uh, grass clippings, you know, everybody's grass is starting to grow yep. this time of year. That's a great source of both material and nitrogen. Yep. Yeah. So use the fish emulsion sparingly, you know, save it for maybe some amendments and save the cost and find some of these other sources for nitrogen and uh, just materials in general. Yeah. And one last little note on compost in general is that you need, for your compost to really work, you need three parts carbon for one part nitrogen. And we often call the, the them greens and browns. Um, with your three parts carbon, that can be anything that is like anything brown, honestly, anything straw right. or cardboard or paper, anything like that. And then you need to put only one part nitrogen to that. So if you have coffee ground or like, if you have coffee grounds, add some cardboard or some paper right. or some sawdust or whatever. Or, um, and I actually just wanted to say too, if you need coffee grounds and you're not a coffee drinker like we are, almost every coffee shop gives them away for free. Starbucks even has a little dumping program where you can actually ask them, hey, can I have a bag of coffee grounds? They'll give it to you for free. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And that's like, that's enough nitrogen to do an entire three. Oh yeah, five. yeah, that's a lot. And I wanna clarify, because when she says three, three, three to one, that's actually in volume. So when you're mixing yeah. volume, 
uh, three to one. I do a two to one generally, oh, yeah. you know, but right in there somewhere. And so just don't confuse that because when you see, when you read about it, what you're going to see is 30 to one is the ratio of carbon to, to nitrogen, but yeah. that's, that's in particles. That's a little bit different when yeah. we're mixing and we're just out on the farm and you're measuring with a five gallon bucket or a yeah. shovel bucket, then that's that three to one you're yeah. talking about. Or do, I mean, like, do you say you do two, I do two, two to one, I do, I do two, two, yeah, two browns, and one to green generally. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that, that gets it in there and gets you close enough. And then kind of from there, it's like, do you want to go with a thermal compost? Or, yeah, well, or then we just, could really Right, then, then you're getting, getting dialed in. Yes. Well, cool. Good on the compost. So let's dive into raising milk goats. And we've been talking about milk goats all week, so I hope you don't mind talking hey, about them just a little bit longer. I I mean, it's you got you to gotta share that good information. I think goats have a bit of a steep learning curve. So anything that I can do to help make that learning curve a little bit uh, smoother... Very cool. I'm happy to do it. That's good because it's it, goats are a great entry point for dairy animals. And, you know, a lot of you, you know, as we've got a large family, dairy goats just aren't going to meet our needs really. Yeah. And, um, you know, Carol and I did dairy goats once for about, well, they weren't even dairy goats. They were just goats for about three days. Yeah. <laughs> and they got into everything. Yep. And, yes, they and, do. You're right. And so they didn't last very long with us. But they have a great purpose in a small holding homestead and even in the large one, you know, depending on what you're doing. So... Um, we've got some questions here that people ask us that our team came up with and that I know people are interested in. And, and you know, and one of the first ones is just, what are the best breeds for milk goats? And, and so, you know, yeah. what are you using? What do you like? And, and the, but then I know there's a little bigger discussion as far as helping somebody choose, because it's really not what's the best breed. It's what's the best breed for you. Yeah. And honestly, almost all of this homesteading information is not what's best. It's what's best for you in right. your situation, because pretty much anything is, my, my mom always says, flexible, adaptable, and out of control. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so the I have Nigerian dwarf goats. Those are the ones that I chose because, A, I think that they're really cute. So that's obviously a, a, a huge importance for me as a photographer. I'm constantly taking pictures and things. So I wanted that, but, um, far more importantly for actual homesteading reasons, they have the highest fat content in their milk. So I think the nice. only other domesticated and, or well, they're not domesticated, but the only other animal that has that high of fat concentration are polar bears. So, um, no, Nigerian dwarf goats, they have about a 14% butter fat content. I think it would be hard to keep a polar bear. Yeah, a little Just bit, saying. a little bit hard, yeah. <laughs> but Nigerian dwarfs, they have a 14% butter fat content in their milk, which, um, you know, whole milk that you get from the grocery store from a cow is, is, uh, is 4%. Mm -hmm. So imagine 14%. It's pretty... That is, that, and, that, and that's value right there is what yeah. that represents. That's high value. Yeah, it's really good. And so that's the reason that I wanted Nigerian dwarfs is because they're like this. They are really small. They are really cute, but they produce a phenomenal quality milk. Um, and then, you know, managed right, that is also the best tasting milk I've ever had. I mean, I like everyone that's come to my house, I do a side by side comparison. You want to taste my cow milk? Do you want to say, taste my goat milk? And everyone says goat milk's the best. Yep. Abigail yep. today said it was better than the cow milk. I know. Yeah. I was so, I was so pleased by that. So. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, so Nigerians are one. That's what you've settled on mm -hmm. that works well for you. But what are some other options as far as dairy breeds? Yeah, if you're looking for higher production. So because Nigerian dwarfs are so small, they like a good Nigerian dwarf will produce about a quart of milk a day. Um, I had one, um, one Nigerian dwarf that was kind of like a unicorn, but she would produce a gallon a day and it was the best milk but she was the worst goat. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so we've moved to, but mostly I, we, so we've moved to other goats that produce a little bit less, but are still quality animals. So we get about a quarter day from Nigerian dwarves. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're looking for more volume, I would suggest going with a Nubian. A Nubian is about a, a is, is a slightly bigger goat, okay. but they are much higher producer. The thing that you sacrifice there though, is the fat content. So Nubian milk has a much lower fat content by ratio. Um, like Half seven percent. I actually think it's uh, I think it's even less than that. Oh, wow. I, I, I don't know a ton about it because I've never kept Nubians myself. But other dairy breeds, Alpines are are good, um, Sonnens are good. But um, really, I would say there's there's literally so many breeds. You can. I had an Angora goat that I um, that I wanted for her fiber, but then I ended up milking her as well. So like basically. Mm -hmm. Any any goat can produce the things that you need. It's just really what's what's available locally to you. Um, what breed is going to make the most sense for the space that you have, and like also you have to think about like 
not just how much fenced area do you have, like how big's your barn? How many animals can you actually fit in there? Because a Nubian goat is over twice the size of a Nigerian dwarf. So mm. I would like in our little barn situation here, I wouldn't feel comfortable having, you know, 11 Nubians in right. there by any means. Yeah. Yeah. So space is a little yeah. bit of a, is a little bit of an issue there. Yeah. Thinking about what works for you on your spot. Yeah. You know, and, and you made, you made a good point there about what you can get. And sometimes we get very, very hung up on the breeds and mm -hmm. I'm actually reading through Joel Salatin's um, polyface micro right now. Yeah. And you know, He's just always got so many words of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things he was talking about, about animals in general, is, you know, getting off the boat about always having to have this particular specialty breed. That's yeah. nice. And, you know, sometimes there's a good reason for that and there's yeah. a fit. But sometimes, especially when you're trying to get started, you know, what do you have access to? You don't want to be driving 1,500 miles yeah. to go buy a specialty $1,500 goat, yep. especially if you've never had goats. That's like down the road 10 years where you're yeah. maybe then getting a breeding program and no stuff, but you want to get started. So make sure yeah. it's accessible. Accessibility is hugely important. Yeah. I mean, even beyond that, because to be able to have milk, you have to have babies. And so then to be able to have babies, you have to have access to other goats to breed to. So if you're not going to keep a buck or a male goat on your own property, you need to have someone close enough nearby that you right. can go visit or have your goats visit or, uh, you know, or you need to learn AI or you need to get in with a vet that can do, do AI. And a yep. lot of vets won't do AI on goats. So there's, there's so many things to consider, but availability locally is, is hugely yeah. important. Cool. Okay, so another question. Are there breeds that work for both milk and meat goats? And this is this is a huge topic because a lot of people getting started, you know, want to do, you know, the most they can with what they have, mm -hmm. kind of like chickens and yep. dual breed chickens, right? And yeah. there's, there's always pros and cons to going with dual purpose. Yep. But, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? And do you have some suggestions for dual purpose breeds? Yeah, I mean, my suggestion for dual purpose would actually be the Nubians because they are larger. So you do like, I mean, if you're going to think about harvesting something for meat, you want to, there to be enough meat to make it worth it. Okay. I actually do have friends that, um, raise Nigerian dwarves and they they eat eat their Nigerian dwarves too and they they say it's great meat it's just there's a lot less Small. meat yeah. on a smaller animal than there would be on a larger one so Nubians are great Boer goats are the best for um for meat so Boer goats yeah it's B-O-E-R oh, Boer yeah, goats yep, yep, okay. um those are great for meat so you might even consider um making yourself a, a an inexpensive little mutt by breeding a, a Boer and a Nubian together and then having um getting those meat and dairy genetics that, yeah see that I think that's a nice strategy get yeah. the dairy goats that you want and as yep. long as the size is compatible get you know or find somebody that has yep. a um Oh gosh, I got stuck. Uh, a boar goat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or an, uh, somebody who has the, has the, a buck. the other kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a boar buck is what I was trying to say. Yes. Yeah, and crossbreed them. Then you're getting a little um, hybrid vigor as well. Yep. You know, exactly. In the growth there. Yep. Yeah. Just don't plan to keep those babies for milking, probably. Yeah. I mean, my buddy Jason um, has boar goats that they raise for me in Texas, and he they they milk them as well. So I mean, they're oh, yeah. There you go. Any animal that has babies produces milk. There you go. Cool. All right. Um, can you raise just one milk goat at a time or is it better to have multiple more than one? Yeah. So goats are herd animals and yeah. it is actually extremely unkind to the animal and yeah. probably to yourself to, to have a herd animal and only have one of them. So I always recommend that people have at least two goats. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have two like high dollar, high value milking goats or that you have to milk both of them. Um, a great strategy with that is to get two, two, like two female goats and to milk one six months a year and then milk the other one the other six go. months a year. And then you've got a full year supply of milk. Um, you can honestly have as many goats as you want, but the absolute bare minimum would be two because goats are herd animals that are also prey animals. So you're going to have a very unsettled animal if you try to just raise a goat by itself. He's going to be miserable. Yeah. 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 You, you really need to think about the mental health of that animal. And if that animal's not comfortable and happy. Yep you're not going to be comfortable and happy. And goats especially, like we, we talked so much this week about the yeah. psychology of goats, but you want your goats to be well settled. And I mean, like the other thing too is your life is going to be miserable even if you just like keep it as a pet because that goat is going to be so attached to you and so like desperate for you and needy yeah. for you. It's not like a dog. You can't just, you know, hope it sits on the couch on the day, like uh, <laughs> while you're at work all day. Right. Um, goats need buddies. 
Yeah. yeah, I would be scared to come home if you <laughs> yeah. left that lone goat in the house to hang out on the couch. Okay, so how much milk can a person expect from one goat a day? Yeah, we talked a little bit about that. Um, it really depends with every goat, the, the breed, the genetics, the, like where they are in their lactation cycle. Is this the first time they've had babies or is it the third time that they've had babies? Because right. The first time they're going to have a little less milk. Next time they're going to have a little more. By the third lactation cycle, they tend to like be kind of at their peak. But like I said, for Nigerian dwarves, I I expect at least a quart per milking. Um, and so because I uh, have my kids also nursing during mm -hmm. the day, I only milk once a day. But if you're doing twice daily milking, that's then a half gallon. So that's yep. not too bad at all. But I always like to think like, is this worth it? If it's not at least a quart of milk a day. To me, it's not worth the all of the dishes and the chore time and everything else um, to maintain an animal. So I would say look for an animal where you can get at least a quart a day. Um, and and beyond that, it really just matters like, okay, what are they eating? What breed is it? What right. are the genetics like? Is it, you know, is it a first timer? Or is it a, a tenth timer? Right. And then you just got to couple that with what you think your needs are going to be, which yeah. kind of runs into the cream. Yep. And uh, a, I didn't know for a long time, and I know a lot of people didn't realize that you can actually separate the cream oh, from yeah. goat's milk yeah. and make other products a little bit. So tell us a little bit, like per maybe per gallon is a good gauge, like per gallon about how much in volume a cream can you get? Yeah. And, you know, a little bit about separating and how you go about that and then um, what you can do with that cream. Great. So in a, like, I, I'm actually going to say a half gallon okay, because these cool. are the ones that I have, but like yep. a half gallon jug is about like this by this. And when you let the cream actually rise to the top, you're actually going to be about, with our goats at least, you're going to be about half and half there. Really? You're now, gonna, you're going to get about a quart Yeah, of cream? about that. However, Seriously. it's not um, goat I'm, milk. I'm warming up to goats a little I bit. I mean, yeah, it's so great. <laughs> And um, like, and just to debunk that myth, like you can make goat butter. Goat butter is delicious and delightful. You can make ice cream. Like literally, okay. we're talking the fattiest, creamiest, best, best stuff. I really, really love wow. love that goat stuff. But one little funny thing about goats is that um, you've you've heard about pasteurized and unpasteurized no, homogenization yep. and everything. <laughs> goats actually naturally homogenize their own milk. Yep. So goat, um, like if you put a, a gallon of of cow milk on the counter, that cream is going to rise and it's going to be like a very visible line and you can literally just so very clear, it off. very separated. But with the goat milk, while you can see it in the jar as a very clear line, it doesn't quite scoop off just like just that easily. So I end up really more like if I'm just skimming the cream like with a spoon, I end up with something more the consistency of like half and half. Okay. Um, and so if I really, really need that heavy cream, I have to use a cream separator. Okay. And they do make small, like you can get micro dairy cream separators. I have one. It's not my favorite thing to use just because it's kind of a pain in the butt to wash and set up all the things just for like a small amount of milk. But when you do set it up, you can process, you know, 20 or 30 gallons of milk. I, I often will freeze the milk and then just process it all at once. So you can process wow. all that milk at once and okay. then you, like it makes it worth that time investment to get that cream separator out and to do that. But you can still, even with that half and half like stuff, you can still make ice cream with that. It's still going to freeze great. You can still make butter with it. You're just going to end up with more, you know, more butter, butter milk. milk. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so, I mean, yeah, you, everything that you can do with cow milk, you can do with goat milk. In fact, my mozzarella cheese from the goats is so much better than my mozzarella cheese with the cow milk. And that's like... A very very easy thing to learn so I make pizza every Sunday we always use goat milk mozzarella on it and it is literally the best thing and the easiest thing to make I mean you're talking a 30 minute time investment it's like a three-hour project but you're just there touching the cheese for about 30 minutes Abigail Anna's warming me up here because she's hitting some of our buttons we love butter uh -oh. we love mozzarella we make pizza every Friday homemade there you pizza go. And so, you know, having some options is great. Yeah, I mean, I had like a whole line of goat milk products. I had my gutter, although that doesn't, it's not the most appetizing sounding name. Your I had <laughs> I had my Gogurt, okay. but apparently Gogurt has already been taken. So, you know, I'm just kind of over I've definitely to... heard that term, yeah. Gogurt's, Gogurt's like the little slurpable. Oh, that's yogurt. right. Yeah, they're in the little, yeah, they're in those little packets. So then I was like, well, maybe I'd call it goat gurt. But then, it, you know, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting goat, out of control goat here. Gurt. I don't, I like goat gurt. I like it. You better, you better claim that one. Yeah. Okay. TM. That's right. Let's see here. Um, 
what are some basic supplies to get started milking goats? And so um, we've been talking all about all this this yeah. week. So trying to do the quick rundown, just maybe not so much supplies and phrase it like, what are some of the just key things you need to know if you're thinking of before you get goats? And guys, don't do what we've done. I'm sure <laughs> Ann has done. And most of us that are up here sharing our knowledge have done. Don't go out and get the goat without thinking about your infrastructure and everything oh, yeah. first. Um, learn from some people that have already done it, have done it the hard way and done it wrong. Yes. You know, get prepared, get set up. So, Anne, what are some things people need to know before they get their goats? Yeah, before you bring your, well, I think we've all gone to tractor supply and come home with some baby kicks oh, and yeah, we're like, we'll build yeah. the coop later. Yeah. We do not do that with Dude, goats. That with because, a milk cow. All right. Well, <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. I, he has heard this story already, but I did that with my first milk goat. I brought her home before I had anything set up. In fact, I'd never milked an animal before. I'd never even had a dog before. And I thought it was a good idea to get a goat that I would need to milk right away. Um, and I learned the very, very hard way that that is not the way you should go about getting any livestock animal. Yep. But um, all that to say, I learned those hard lessons so you don't have to. So the number one most important thing that you need for goats is, I mean, let's think about any living being you need. Food, water, mm -hmm. shelter. Yep. Access to good food, access to clean water, and at least a three-walled shelter. If you're living in a, a climate that has extreme temperatures, you're going to need a barn that, that shuts and you're going to need a way to keep them cool if it's hot and warm if it's cold. But beyond that, the thing that you absolutely need for goats is a good fence. Goats are massive escape artists. They um, are not intentionally mischievous, but I do think that it is kind of interesting that like the that goats are often impersonated, like uh, personified as the devil uh, for yeah. good reason, because they are very very like they are just being themselves. They are very itchy creatures. They like to scratch themselves on things, which often will open up a hole in the fence. They like to nibble on things, which is a great way for them to learn how to open your gate right. latches. Like all of these things. So you need to have an absolute bulletproof way to contain your goats before you ever bring them home. Otherwise they're going to get into, I mean, like I had a goat eat the wires out of my tractor. I have had to replace the microphone cable for my YouTube videos about three times. And it's not cheap because one of my goats just loves to eat that cable right out of my pocket. I have had a goat nearly get hit by a passing car because she got out and was out there. I've had goats cause about um, $1,500 worth of damage to pl a plumbing project that I was doing. They came in Ouch. and ate um, my entire garden once, um, yeah, which was not great. So, you know, uh, having a good fence is, is your probably number one priority. And that is um, not, just, not just like the actual structure of it, but thinking too, goats can jump, they climb on things. So I put one time a little play structure a little too close to my fence line and they just jumped right on top of the play structure and jumped right over the fence, got right into the garden. You know, so you just reminds me of some of the old cartoons, but that you know, all humor is built on some truth. Yeah, right? exactly. We <laughs> cried about it first, so that you can laugh about it later. Um, but yeah, so that that's the biggest thing is like having a solid plan for how you're going to contain them. They are prey animals too, so like yeah. they need like for them to feel safe and secure and all those things. Like they need to know that they are actually safe and secure. So that means like you also can't just have like a little short fence that a dog could jump over. Um, a lot of people have goats in the city, which is great. Um, there's less natural predators there, but if you're, you know, out in a rural area mm -hmm. like we are, then you've got to think about, well, how am I going to keep it how safe from gonna protect them? A, a cougar or a, or a, you know, a pack of coyotes? And and there's lots of options there, but we could we could right. talk about this all day. But that's yeah, that's it. the best thing. And then the other thing is, if you're going to milk your goat, you need to have a milking stanchion. And I actually have a whole YouTube video about that on my YouTube channel. It's good. Um, you can look me up, Anne of All Trades, and you can see goat milking stanchion and see how to build one. It's a pallet cut in half with a little hinge on the front. So it's nothing too fancy. Yeah, you don't have to be elaborate for some of these yeah. things. I mean, it probably if you're going to put money in infrastructure, it's going to be that fencing where you're going to yeah. really do it right because there's so many things that you can DIY. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've made everything that I needed for my goats, but I, I mean, I spent... $4,000 building a, a, a solid goat pen before I ever stepped foot on this piece of property because I knew when I when I when when we moved in and we pulled up in that trailer, I needed somewhere that I could put my goats and trust that they'd still be there in the morning. And I think that's where a lot of the frustration for people comes from is the fencing issues, is them getting out because yeah. once they get out, they're curious, they're, they're you know mischievous, they like to get into things and that's where all the horror stories come yeah. from. So if you contain them well, you know, a lot of the rest of it works itself out. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Cool. Let's see. Um, 
Let's see here, tips if you want to sell your goat's milk. So I'd say that's a little advanced. You better you better just get to <laughs> hanging out with goats a few years first. But what's the Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, tips for selling goat milk. Well, here's the thing. I actually am not, uh, unless you're really doing it on a pretty big scale, which to be honest, I'm doing it on a pretty big scale already. And there's really not that much left over. Because if you're talking about a quart a day, like my biggest sale, sale product is yogurt. And that's just because it was a way for me to divide a gallon into four quarts that are saleable for the same price as the gallon. Um, but I will also say too, in a lot of places, there are laws about selling raw milk. So you do want to watch out for that. Yeah. There's like some ways around those things, but um, really just like, I would say that the way that you sell your goat's milk is the same way that you sell anything else. Tell a story, like find find the your niche audience, the people that actually need that thing. And then like, Tell them how your product is going to change their yeah. life and make their lives better. Absolutely. But I would add, you know, if you're getting started, don't think that you're going to go get goats and go right into, and this is the same really with any animal, go right into an enterprise, a money-making oh, yeah. enterprise. You, you need to uh, you need to cut your teeth, so to speak. You need to get out there, get familiar with the animal. And, you know, no matter what any of us can share with you, you still got to go have experiences, yeah. right? And, and so... Don't get goats because you're going to start a business. Get goats because you're interested in having goats. You want the goat's milk for a part of your provision. And learn the ins and outs. Spend a few years getting to know them yeah. and know how to work with them, know how to care for the milk. If you're going to sell something like that, you really better know how you're caring for your milk. Oh, yeah. And, and um, so that when you're handing it off to somebody else, eventually you're handing a product that you really know what you're doing and you stand behind. Yeah. And, and then through that, you'll be able to figure out, you know, a lot of these other things about going into business. Yeah, I mean, just to echo what he said, even about just like thinking about anything as a business. I think as as homesteaders, we tend to be really entrepreneurial people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of us have a really hard time just um, like just doing a hobby, just just to enjoy it or just to do anything to enjoy it. Like, <laughs> I mean, um, our, our mutual friend, right. Melissa, that introduced uh -huh. us, yeah. we always talk about like, we don't know how to have a hobby. We only know how to start a business. But the thing about farming is that like, it is not until you have enough experience, it is not a viable business plan. In fact, like, I mean, even if you have enough, like, even if you have a cow, which I do, like just one cow's worth of milk is not in and of itself a business. Yeah, like, and, it's not um, a dairy. We talk about the, the $63 tomato, like the person who thought that they could plant a garden to save money. Oh, right. And I mean, yes, there are ways to do that. And if you want to learn more about business and entrepreneurship and farming and how those can go hand in hand, Check out Joel Selatin. You Can Farm is a great, yep, great resource sure um, for that. But yeah, I mean, goats is a business. Honestly, um, I make about 10 times what I make from milk selling babies. And for me, the babies are where the business is because I'm selling registered purebred goats that mm -hmm. have incredible genetics. But I mean, it's taken me um, eight years to build out a genetic line that where I'm actually able to sell yeah. those babies for those prices because I can actually stand behind that product, but or that product. But even at that, it's not a money making endeavor. I mean, like considering all the other things that I have to do to maintain my goat herd, like I'm lucky if I break even, and I've been doing this for a long time. Okay. All right, let's see here. I think we got time for about one more, and you touched on this a little bit, um, but let's just go a little bit more. The difference between cow's milk to goat's milk. Mm -hmm. And you obviously, you're doing both. You've got a dairy cow, yeah. and you've got goats. And so what do you like better, and you know what, what's, what's the difference? And I think probably what's wrapped up in here is a lot of goat milk is goaty. You yeah. talked about your goat milk and how good it is, and it's yeah. very good, but that's not the common experience, yeah. and that's not what most people think of. And so maybe tell us a little bit about why that is and and um, how to make sure that you've got goat's milk that you're gonna enjoy. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Uh, I don't really know, like, I love goat cheese. Like, if you've ever gotten goat cheese from the store that, like, Chev, you know, you can mm -hmm. dip it in crackers, put fruit on the top. Like, I love goat cheese. Like, that that kind of goat cheese is, is, is exactly what I want in a cheese. Yeah, very flavorful. But I do not want to drink a glass of goat cheese <laughs> tasting milk. And that's what most most goat milk that ha most people have had tastes like that. It's, it tastes like the way a male goat smells. Like it's musky and it's like I So why, why is that? Tell us one of the reasons. Yeah. You, we were talking about that this week. And, yeah. and what's one of the main reasons why it does taste goaty, tastes yeah. like a goat. Most goat milk that comes from the grocery store, first of all, it's going to taste goaty because it's, it's, it's old. 
it's been like, you know, it took a long time to get from the goat, like onto like, so as it ages, right. Store. So as it so, ages, it naturally, even if you're doing it at home, as yep. it ages, it does take on a stronger flavor compared to when it's yep. fresh. Exactly. So we, we talked a little bit about raw milk. Raw mm -hmm. milk doesn't actually spoil. It just changes yep. in taste and texture as it continues to age. And so goat milk is best when it's fresh. So I really like, like if I'm just going to drink a nice cold glass of goat milk, I want it to be with about like less than a week old, surely. It will keep as drinkable milk for about two weeks if you're extremely cleanly in your milking practices. But ultimately there's kind of like three ways that we make our goat milk taste good and not goaty. And the first one is I don't keep any, um, any bucks, any male goats on the property. They, um, they themselves are quite stinky and anything that is really stinky is actually going to then lend itself, like come into the flavor of your milk. Go male goats are constantly re releasing pheromones, which then affect the hormone um, balance of the ladies around them. And so that affects the flavor of the milk. So no male goats, um, it's gotta be fresh. And then cleanliness, cleanliness, cleanliness. And so because we're doing raw milk here, we are like our, our, our milking practices start in keeping an immaculate barn. I want to make sure that like from teat to table, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I like it. Like, yep. like there is no right. possibility for any kind of bacteria or harmful harmful pathogen to come into contact with the milk. I um like I clean the goat like before like as she comes up on the stand, but she should be pretty clean to start with because she's coming from a very clean barn. Um, I like, you know, I, I'm fastidious with the way that I that I do my whole milking process. Mm -hmm. And then all of my um, all my implements are extremely clean. I filter it and then refilter it, and then it's stored in glass, and then it's consumed quickly. And yeah, the other thing that can really affect it is your feed. And so, um, but the, like to be totally honest, the feed is kind of the last in those in those that list of okay. three, and then four if you think about the feed. Yeah. But I feed chaff hay um, and and natural forage, and that's pretty much all that I need to just literally make the best tasting milk I can possibly have. And it really is like I have all my goat milk customers; they can never get enough. They're like, "This is the best goat milk I've ever had. When can we get more?" I'm like, "Sorry, I only have so many goats and so many hours in the day." You know, I, I'm I'm thinking about getting goats just so that I can make your coffee ice cream. Oh yeah, that, that stuff is so good. Yeah, she's got a great video on coffee ice cream, and those are yeah. two of my favorite things in life to consume. So you put the two things that the Lord gave us together, and they become so so good. Oh, coffee and ice cream, oh, they yeah. belong. Very cool. Well, Anne, it has been cool hanging out here with you. And I think this is just so informative, folks, especially for our audience, because yeah. we don't talk a lot about goats. Yeah. And I think if Abigail has it her way, you've definitely sold her on goats. Yes. Well, here's <laughs> so, the thing. You so, said probably. And I don't know about you, but if my dad ever told me probably, that was a yes in my book. Uh, so yeah, I think you're yeah, in it. I think you're yeah, in it now. Well, I got a dad's heart. I'm just slow to commit. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so um, anyways, we're going to wrap up here. But mm -hmm. Tell people just for a minute how they can find you, yeah. what resources you have out there so they can look you up and what you're doing. Anne is just so cool. She does, she, Anne of all trades. I mean, she's doing goats. She's doing dairy cows. She's composting out here. I love your composting system. You. You've got a great video on that. Um, you know, some of my videos I've done some of the smaller scale and I'm, I'm really composting at large scale. Yeah. She's got a great like mid range system mm -hmm. going here. So that's worth checking out. Um, and so, yeah, just how can people uh, check you out and find out? You can find me doing? anywhere on the internet at Anne of All Trades. It's A N N E of All Trades. It's a jack of all trades, but a master of none. But what most people don't know is the rest of that quote is oft better still than a master of one. All right. So I, I figured, it. you know, if I'm going to try all the things, I'm going to build up a, a skill set, and I've um, brought a camera along so that I can share it all with you. So you can find me. On my website, Anne of All Trades, that'll take you to all my social media profiles as well. I have Instagram, so you can see what's going on on a daily basis. YouTube, so you can find out what's going on a weekly basis. And then on my website, you can get my classes and courses. I have a raw milk course that you can find on my website, so you can learn all the things that you can do with uh, goat milk. Very cool. Well, Anne, it's been great hanging with you. Yeah, great. You guys, it's been great hanging with you, and we will see you soon. See you Goodbye. later. Bye. Bye.